in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. It's so good to see you. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, who picked that set list? I normally like to start my sermons off on a happy note, you know, but I think my face was just on the floor. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Bree, for that. Uh, let's preach four services with tears. Come on, somebody. But hey, good morning. It's so good to see you. Can we go ahead right out the gate and give it up for all the new guests in the room today? Come on. We are so blessed and excited you decided to join us today for service. If you enjoy your time here at Redemption today, please fill out one of those connect cards on the chair in front of you. We would love to get to know you a little better. And if you are new or maybe just not aware, you have come to church today on a very exciting day because walls are falling down. Come on. And for once, I mean that in a good way. Construction has officially begun on our new building. Prayers are being answered. The Lord is moving us forward to our new home. Come on, where even more breakthrough will happen. Even more life change will sweep the streets of Southeast Texas. Are you excited for what God is doing in our new building? Come on. Until then, guys, hold tight, stay strong, keep praying, stay generous, grab a mop, and let's keep going. Amen? Yeah. Shout out to Big Bucket Sunday. Yeah. This might be our last one, okay? You're going to miss it. Trust me. My name is Trevor Knox. I serve here on staff as our executive ministry director where I oversee all Sunday operations from our serve teams to small groups. And today I am blessed to be able to preach God's word to you. If you have your Bible, let's go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 23. We are continuing our series in Acts that we have titled The Church so we can learn from the first church on how to continue to grow into the church that God is calling us to be. I am loving this series because I love the book of Acts. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's been a wild ride. Okay, to me, Acts is playing out like a movie with several different genres, right? It starts out as an underdog story like Rocky. The disciples start from rags. They go to the riches. They get filled with the Holy Spirit. They are equipped to go save people's lives through the gospel. It's exciting. And then it turns into a persecution story. It turns into Shawshank Redemption which is also the name of our new building, by the way. We definitely won't get sued for that. And then Paul comes on the scene, and it's an action movie. They're getting beat up. There's miracles. There's mysterious side characters. Things are getting set on fire. Michael Bay could direct this, put a robot in it, and nobody would notice. All right. And now it's transitioned into a legal drama where Paul is on trial screaming to the Jewish people the truth of Jesus, and they don't like it. But he's like, you can't handle the truth. But the truth is, there's so many lessons we can learn from this text. This is such an important text. Because what we can learn is how we can trust God with our trials. Because Paul is literally on trial, but he's also facing many of the same trials that we face as we embrace our walk of faith. So that's what I want to talk about today. Whether you are newly saved or you've been saved for 50 years, facing, tr facing trials is a reality of the lives we live. Facing trials is not something that we can avoid. Facing trials is something we are called to do, and it's something that unites all of us under the love of God. Through suffering, we are all connected. Through perseverance is where we learn more about our purpose, and through faith, we are drawn closer to the Lord. I think it's safe to say that every single person in this room is either facing some kind of trial currently, or some kind of hardship in some shape or form. And in this room alone, there are stories upon stories of heartache, sadness, distress. Maybe it's the breaking of a relationship. Maybe it's the pain of divorce. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's tension with someone you love. Or maybe it's something that's just as heavy, like a loss of sense of direction or purpose or severe financial stress that you don't know how to escape or you don't know how you're going to persevere, right? A few weeks ago, I had the honor of preaching out of Acts chapter 21, where we discussed the importance of choosing our calling over comfort. And it was not an easy message to preach. I didn't really notice it until I got done with the fourth service. And I'm like, that was tough. Because <laughs> we have to choose our calling over comfort. That's not fun. But sometimes it's what God calls us to do. Sometimes it's where we learn the most important lessons that we need to hear from facing trials and trusting God in this process. And what we have to remember when we're facing these trials, the lessons we're going to learn most importantly are that we have a God 
who does love us, a God who trusts us, and a God who will carry us through any storms we face because these storms are happening for a reason. This is the great hope we have as believers, and I know this from a very, very real experience. See, I wasn't raised in church. I was saved at the age of 28, actually in this church. Um, I was actually raised in doctor's offices where I was diagnosed at a very young age, probably third grade, with several mental illnesses. I was diagnosed with manic depression, um, an anxiety disorder, severe ADHD. Um, I'm pretty sure they said I was bipolar at one point, right? Back in the 90s, they were like Oprah giving out diagnosis. They're like, now you're schizophrenic, right? They were, <laughs> they were trying to figure out their bearings of the whole medical world, all right? But uh, this, th- this grew into my adult life where uh, my mental illness is still haunting me. Right? I could not escape suicidal ideations. I could not escape uncontrollable intrusive thoughts telling me to kill myself on a daily basis for 20 years. And then I received prayer one time. After not being a believer, I went to bed dead in my sins, ready to take my own life. And I woke up a new man. Amen. I woke up. I woke up and, I re- and God revealed himself to me in a way that would only make sense to me because I was such a vehement denier of the faith. But he removed my depression. He removed my suicidal thoughts. He removed my anxiety disorder. He did not remove my ADHD. <laughs> I think we all need a thorn in our side. He's like, you get to keep that one. So if, if I do lose my spot today, okay, take it up with the big man. But the difference between facing life without God and with God is not even comparable. When I would face trials before, right, I would self-sabotage. I would hurt myself. I would find ways to not take blame and not own up to my mistakes, right? I would make people around me miserable in this experience. And then once God broke through, he showed me, took my pain, and turned it into something else I could learn from where I could be a bringer of hope. I could share a message that saves lives. I could be fueled by the Holy Spirit who gives me peace in times it doesn't make sense. Where I don't have to freak out anymore because I'm not alone. Because no matter what life throws at us, there is a blessing in the burden. There is a blessing in the battle. Where before Jesus, my life would spiral into chaos. And now he lifts me up. And now he reassures me through, through faith that it's actually going to be okay. It's going to work out for his good and for his purpose. We have to keep this p- perspective. So today we're talking about one of the most important aspects of navigating life, and that is trusting God in our trials. So let's jump back into Acts chapter 23 just to catch you guys up. Okay, this is a big book. The entire theme of Acts is this, getting the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Okay, we need to get the gospel, the disciples need to get the, the, the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome because Rome at the time is the epicenter of the world. If you can get the word to Rome, it will spread to the ends of every nation. This is Paul's mission. He goes from a murderer of Christians, has an encounter with Jesus, is saved and turned around into a messenger of Jesus. Okay, and then he faces many, many trials in order to get back to Jerusalem. So he needs to go back to his homeland in Jerusalem where he once persecuted Christians. But when he goes, he's not welcomed anymore because he's a Christian now. He's not following his old beliefs. They're like, Paul, what happened to you? They want Paul dead. And Paul is almost killed. But instead of being murdered and the riots that are stirred up, he is rescued by Roman guards who throw him instead in prison. So remember, Paul knew he was going to be persecuted, but because God told him, he pressed forward anyway. Now, we're actually starting at the end of chapter 22 and verse 22. They kind of all tie together, and we have a lot of verses to cover. So I'm going to read everything up front, and we will put the application on the back end. Now, we're starting where Paul was about to be killed in the riot, but he's given a chance to speak to the mob where he shares the gospel. And now, right before he's about to be murdered, he's rescued. Cue the Michael Bay music. We don't have it. Cool. Let's jump in. Verse 22. Up to this word, they listened to him. So this is the Jewish people that just finished listening to Paul share his story. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks back into jail, saying that he should be examined by flogging. He should be tortured to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it law for for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Paul reminds the guard who's about to whip him, can you do this? I'm a Roman citizen. 
When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to tell him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought the citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him and torture him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. So right now, the mob is screaming that Paul should be killed, but the Roman tribune, who are the guards, instead say they're going to torture him in order to get answers from him. But right before, Paul has an ace up his sleeve. He reminds them, hey, you know I'm a Roman citizen, right? And they're like, oh, they're not allowed to beat Roman citizens without trial or evidence. So they withdraw their flogger, And they rightfully back out. Verse 30. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set set him before them. Now they are taking Paul to trial to find out why does everyone want to kill you? Why does everyone hate you so much? He's not getting tortured. He's getting a trial. Why are these people so mad at Paul? And then Paul. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good consciousness up to this day. So Paul stares at the council. He's before the council now, the council of Pharisees and Sadducees. And he looks at them, it says, intently. And he says, despite being beaten and persecuted, he's got swagger. His chest is puffed. Paul has moxie. And he stares at the council and says, everything I've done is right in the eyes of God. The palsy move. Verse (laughs) 2. Not in my notes. And the high priest and Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. So now, without hesitation, they just smacked Paul in the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that that was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So Paul gets smacked in the face, but he is not backing down, right? Jesus says, turn the other cheek. But Paul is not Jesus. He's from the south side of the kingdom, okay? <laughs> Paul, it, Paul's like, God's going to kill you. Okay, Paul is from the hood. And then he admits that he did not know he was talking to the high priest. He didn't realize he was talking to the high priest. He says, my bad, I should have respected you. I didn't realize you were the high priest because we are called to respect our authoritative leaders. Right, America? (laughs) Verse 6, now when people perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So this is genius. This is genius on Paul's part. He is standing before the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He knows how they think. He knows what they believe in. He knows what they stand for. He knows what they're passionate about. More importantly, he knows how to tick them off. So instead, he gets the Pharisees and the Sadducees to start fighting each other. The Pharisees, they're Jewish. They believe in the supernatural works of God. They believe in the resurrection, they believe, or the possibility of resurrection. They believe in the afterlife. All the Sadducees do not believe in the supernatural or the resurrection. They don't really believe in anything hopeful or miraculous or metaphysical, which is where they actually got their name, the Sadducees, because they're very sad, you see? Uh, as a preacher, you're obligated to make that joke anytime you say Sadducee, so y'all forgive me for that one. Verse 9, then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away among them by force and bring him in to the barracks. So instead of focusing on the actual issue, Paul gets the Pharisees and the Sadducees to start fighting. Okay, imagine if you were on trial. You're being convicted by Republicans and Democrats. All right, and they're about to convict you, and you just go, immigration, and they start fighting about it. (laughs) That's what happened, and that's what's genius about this. And then they just take Paul back to his cell, okay? He kind of sneaks away. He's like, Verse 11, the following night, 
the Lord stood by Paul and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So now Paul is taken back to his jail cell. And while he's there, the Lord appears reminding him to take courage. This is all a part of the plan. I know things are crazy. I have sent you here for a reason. You are facing these trials for a reason. Take courage. Do not be afraid. Verse 12. When it was the day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. That escalated quickly. The the, the people who are rioting against Paul are now fasting, not eating or drinking, until they kill Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priest and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So Paul's persecutors, the mob who tried to kill him, are still not happy. They're saying jail is not good enough. This is taking too long. We are going to fast, not eat, or drink until Paul is dead. They are serious about taking out Paul, and they have 40 people ready to ambush Paul the second they get the chance, and they're trying to conspire with the council and the Roman guards to bring them to a place where they can kill him. They are posting up like secret assassins. There's 40 of them. They're saying, hey, bring Paul down here uh, for a trial, and we will kill him as soon as we see him. They do not want to hear about Jesus. They do not want to hear the Messiah. They are hell-bent on taking out Paul. Verse 16, now the son of Paul's sister his nephew, heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you. And he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire something more closely about him, but do not be persuaded by them. For more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one you have informed me of these things. Before the mob can get to Paul, Paul's nephew hears about the conspiracy and then he is able to warn the Roman guard who was looking after Paul to not let him fall for the conspiracy so he can be protected. Do not listen to anything they're trying to tell you. It's a ruse. It's an inside job. They want Paul dead. It's a trap. Verse 23, then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready, 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also, provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. So now Claudius, who is the head of the Roman guards, has set up an escape plan for Paul. They're going to sneak him out in the middle of the night. They're going to arm him with protection, and they're going to protect him from this secret plot to kill him. They're going to protect Paul, sneaking him out in the middle of the night. Verse 25, and he wrote a letter for this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So Claudius, the leader of the Roman guards, he's sending a letter with Paul as well all about the secret escape plan to get to the governor of Caesarea, Felix. This way, Felix knows that Paul is to be protected and why he's being sought after so intently. Verse 31, so the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. It's a tough word for me. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with them. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. So now Paul has been rescued from the plot and conspiracy to kill him because his nephew happened to hear about the plan to kill him. The Roman guards then decided to protect him and they provide him a secret escape in the middle of the night. So this text, it's incredible and it's so important. This text is teaching us how Paul is choosing despite his trials, despite his unfortunate placement, despite his hardships. Paul is choosing 
to trust in God through his trials. So what I would like to do today, this is a lot of Bible, right? A lot of Bible. But like I said, it's like a movie. It plays out like crazy. There's so much to apply from this. I want to take five key points to apply to our lives for how we can trust God with our trials. So it's playing out like a movie. What tends to happen in any movie? In order to move the plot forward, there's crazy coincidences, right? Crazy coincidence. Something happens, and by coincidence, something else happens. The plot gets crazy, and then there's some kind of happy ending, right? My favorite movie of all time is The Dark Knight. If you disagree, that's totally cool. You're wrong. <laughs> Masterpiece, okay? But if you look at Batman's origin, okay, he is a kid who happens to see his rich parents die. He happens to have the money to become a superhero, and he happens to use that money to build up Gotham. But we are talking about real life and real people who are experiencing something else. You see, friends, when we talk, when we walk with God, there is no such thing as coincidence. God works in two ways. One, he works in the miraculous, right? This is where God will break the code of reality. It's whenever he intercepts the laws of life as we know it in order to achieve his will. So this can be like a divine healing like we've seen so many times here at the church, amen? amen. This can be a conversion when someone who is deemed too far gone finally comes to Jesus and has their life completely changed around. This is a miracle. These are the crazy things we see that God will do in order to get our attention and bring glory to his name. This is where God shows off. But God also works in another way. And these are the things that we cannot see. What others would call coincidence, we as Christians call providence. And we can trust God through his providence. So how many crazy situations had to play out for Paul to survive here? He happened to be saved from the mob by the Roman tribune. He happened to know exactly how to get the Pharisees and Sadducees to fight each other instead of persecuting them on the spot. Paul's nephew just happened to hear about the conspiracy to kill him. Paul is trusting in God's sovereignty and he is trusting in God's plan despite the hostility that he's facing. Despite his life being at stake, he is trusting God and God's plan and he's facing it boldly. Because he knows in the end who is ultimately in control. The Lord we serve. The Lord we serve. So what's happening? To Paul is not coincidence. It's happening all by God's providence. So for us, we, we have to remember and we have to trust that God is working even when we can't see it. Even when we don't feel it. Every single day, every single second, God is working in the unseen realm in order for us to glorify him and in order for us to seek his will and his presence. I think uh, Jacob said it really, really well last week. Hey, can we give it up for Jacob's sermon last week? Come on. So proud of him. I think he said one of his favorite songs is called A Million Little Miracles, which to me sounds like a Veggie Tales title. I haven't heard that one. Shout out to Larry the Cucumber. But a million, little, a million little miracles is absolutely true. No matter what we're facing, no matter what trials we are going through, God is in the waiting. He's believing a billion different things at once in order to draw us closer to him. Amen. And for us, this should bring great comfort. In times of peril and tension, we have to surrender our control to his plan. We have to surrender the outcome. Otherwise, we can imprison ourselves in our own thoughts because we want control, which leads us to sin and being trapped in our own sin. Nothing happens by chance. You are here in this room today for a reason. You didn't brush your teeth today, Ethan, for a reason. That's why I wanted him to sit on the front row. The world will say, what a crazy coincidence, where we would say, look how good our God is. Or we can lose sight of God's will for our lives when we forget that we are not in control. You can have control or spiritual growth. You cannot have both. We always hear everything happens for a reason. Yes, but everything happens in God's will when we know to surrender the outcome. We can trust God through his providence. He is the author. Take solace in knowing that he is working in ways that we cannot see. He's working in things that we cannot see or fathom. We can trust God through his providence, and that will help us most when we are prepared. We have to be prepared. Number two, we can trust God with our trials through preparations. We have a part to play. My favorite part of this story is probably when Paul tricked the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Like I said before, it was a genius, right? Why did Paul speak so boldly at the council? And why did Paul survive when he knew he was about to be tortured? Because Paul was prepared. 
Paul was a Pharisee. He knows how they think. Paul was an evangelist. He knew that he had the Holy Spirit to carry him through the storm. Through God's providence, Paul was a Roman citizen. But through Paul's preparation, he knew that he had an ace up his sleeve. Why did I wear a windbreaker in the summer? Again, Paul knew when he came back to Jerusalem that he was going to just, he wasn't just going to skip into town and be welcomed with open arms. He knew he was going to be persecuted. He knew he was going to be attacked. He knew the threat of what was about to come, but Paul was prepared, not just prepared to survive, but prepared to suffer for God's purpose. This means we have to be prepared to suffer for God's purpose. We have to be ready for the trials that are to come in this life. We have to be prepared for when things don't go our way. And I believe that if we want to make sure we are covered in the full armor of God, okay, we should probably fall Follow Paul's example. Okay, Paul had the most difficult um, path in ministry you can imagine. Okay, I think he set a very good example for us to follow. So I'm going to list you guys five, way, five ways we can prepare for pain. This is what Paul did. Number one, read your Bible. We have to know the word of God and we have to immerse ourselves with the word of God. Paul was armed with the word of God. And he made, whenever he made the mistake of screaming at the high priest, what did he say? I did not know, brothers, that he was a high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. This is Paul quoting Exodus. He's using the word of God to right his wrongs. That's what the Bible does for us. It writes our wrongs. It leads us to repentance. It nourishes our soul and it equips us for adversity. God's word is the highest authority of our lives, and it's our greatest blessing to even have access to it. The answer to any of our problems we are facing in this life can always be found in the Bible. What a blessing that is. Number two, pray every day. Prayer is not a last resort, right? It's a first response. It is the connection that allows us to have relationship with the living God who we can trust in the face of adversity. Again, when I was first saved, I realized quickly that these coincidences that were happening weren't just coincidences because God was answering prayers that I was asking. I would pray and be, let's try this out. And then it would happen. And I would start seeing things I wasn't seeing that before. It was all through prayer. So whenever you wake up, you've got to pray. Whenever you go to bed, you have to pray. Whenever you go to work, you have to pray. Everything in between, you have to pray. The answer to our problems are always found in the Bible, but the way we get to know the Lord is through praying to him. By providence, not by coincidence, we pray and God answers. Number three, join a local church. Paul's mission was to spread the gospel to the end of the earth, and he did that by doing what? He was planting churches. Redemption was planted in 2016. That's because 2,000 years ago, the Lord sent the disciples on a mission. We are a product of Paul's mission. Why was this so important? Because the church is the bride of Christ. The church is what Jesus is coming back for, and the church is not a building. Praise God, because I don't think the Lord would be stoked on this. <laughs> but the church is his people. But praise God, we have a building to meet in. Amen? Amen. Come on, rats included. The church it's for equipping the saints, that's you, and for reaching the lost. That's the person you're praying for to sit next to you. Where do lost people go when they're thinking about trying out this Jesus thing? They're probably not going to go to your small group. They're probably not going to your house church. They're going to go where the saints gather. They're going to be called to where the saints gather. And God's people come here to be equipped by his word and to serve his mission. If it was important for Paul it should be important to us. So congratulations to all of you for prioritizing the gathering of the saints today. Good for you. Come on. <laughs> Number four, live in community. The first thing Jesus did in his ministry was what? He started a small group. The first thing Paul did after being saved was joining a small group. We were created for community, made for multiplication, designed for discipleship because it's our faith that carries us through this life, but we are only human. So whenever our faith isn't enough, the person next to you is there to help you, is there to help carry you. God has sent the person next to you to hold you up. Small groups are launching in September. And guys, I encourage you, while, while the sanctuary is, is used for strengthening us in God's word and for connecting us while we serve together, sanctification happens in the living room. Real life change starts to happen in the living room. So I encourage you, join a small group in September, okay? Because no one walks alone, Amen. Number five, we worship. Worship is warfare, and worship is our weapon. 
When we choose to worship instead of worrying, we are choosing to magnify who God is above everything else, God above our problems. When we choose Jesus over our financial hardship, when we choose Jesus over our anxiety, when we choose Jesus over our failures, when we choose Jesus over our trials, we are choosing Jesus as a true head of our lives, true king of our lives. Just like prayer, when life is good, we worship. When life is hard, we worship. Our worship is warfare against the enemy who hates us. We praise God that we are in his sovereign presence and that we are a part of his plan. Whenever we worship, we shift the atmosphere in the room. That's, right. That's why people who come to this church, and from day one, they're like, yeah, this is my church. because they said they felt God in the parking lot. Amen. Right? Before they even set foot in this building, right? And it wasn't Hunter yelling at them. <laughs> they feel God from the parking lot till they come up to the pulpit. Why? Because we've been worshiping for hours. Because we have been welcoming and ushering and praising and enthroning God all morning. Okay, we change the atmosphere of the room whenever we worship. Worship is, says, I'm going to stop looking at me, and I'm going to start looking at him. Yes. That's when everything changes. Yes. We have to stay prepared because we never know when trials will come. We just know they will. Prepare as well as you can, and God will take care of the rest. We can trust God through our trials with preparation, and we can trust God through our trials because he will protect us. After Paul is taken back to the barracks, the Lord shows up and speaks to him and says, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. After this, the conspiracy and the plot to kill Paul is made, but it is not successful because God is not done with Paul's mission, and God uses his own people to protect Paul from any danger that may oppress him. When we hear this, it sounds great. We're like, yes, take courage. That sounds great for Paul. That sounds great for Paul, but I can't afford my rent. Sounds great for Paul, but my marriage is falling apart. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this loss in my life. I don't know how to not give in and quit, but this is false because the words that mean take courage are only said five times in the New Testament. And guess who says them? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Imagine what Paul was actually feeling here. Of course, he was in God's will. Of course, he had a feeling that things would work out. Of course, he was bold, but don't you think he was afraid? He was anxious about what was going to happen. He's living on thin ice. He knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel, but he couldn't see it. He was terrified. He didn't know when he was going to be killed. He didn't, for a fa- <clears throat> he didn't know for a fact that the Roman guard would have protected him. So the Lord had to comfort him and remind him, hey, take courage. You're here for a reason. We tend to always want God to accomplish his will when it's most convenient for us, but uh, God is not obligated to do that. God is not obligated to do that. Sometimes he will choose the most difficult times in our lives to be the most, for him to be the most glorified and to accomplish his purposes. There's a reason for you to take courage because God will providentially protect you whenever you can't see it. Every time Jesus says take courage, it's because someone is dealing with a matter of worry, a matter of fear, discouragement, but Jesus is our great encourager. He is our great protector. Paul has to take courage even though there will be more persecution. This is not the end of his story. But he does not have to be afraid and we do not have to be afraid because the Lord is with us. If we are prepared, we will see that we are protected. And if we are protected, then we can take courage for whatever life goes at us. In your darkest pits, he's there. In your lowest valleys, Jesus is there. In your deepest sorrow, Jesus is there. Because when we are in God's will, we are always safest. When we are in God's will, we do not have to be afraid. Do not be afraid. God's will directs us, and his grace protects us. His grace will protect you. Take courage because the Lord has put you here for a reason. Take courage because God trusts you with the season that you're in right now. Take courage because there is a blessing in the battle. Take courage because your sins are forgiven. Take courage because the love of Jesus is never out of reach. Take courage because the victory has already been achieved. Take courage because you are a child of God saved by the blood of Jesus and chosen to carry his spirit inside of you. You are not alone in the trials you're facing. God's people do not head into battle alone. Look at the people beside you. Just like Paul's nephew providentially showed up, God has protected you by giving you an army who will stand with you at your lowest points. An army to stand and fight for you has given you a church that will not judge you for your sins, but they will remind you of his forgiveness. 
We don't need to see the light at the end. We just need to know that it's there. He will give you direction. And by his grace, you have been given protection. But that's not all we have been given. On this side of the cross, God will give you provision. After Paul is protected by the Roman guards, what happens? They sneak him into Caesarea, but he is not alone. Verse 23 says, Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horses and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also, provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. Guys, Paul's enemies consisted of 40 angry men who were going to assassinate him at all costs. They were not eating food or drinking water until they killed Paul. And the Lord said, hey, Paul, here's 200 soldiers, 70 dudes on horses, 200 spearmen, and Paul gets a horse. That was way cooler to me than you guys. Okay. <laughs> Paul was at rock bottom. His back was against the wall. His life was hanging in the balance and God shows up. What does he do? God shows off. Paul is not only protected, but he is provided for. When, the things feel, when things feel like they are at the end of the rope, when all hope seems lost, when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, boom, that's when God shows up. That's when God shows off. If you've been coming to redemption for a while, you know right now you are sitting in God's providence because our old chairs were sent straight from hell. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know how good you got it. But if you've been coming for a while, then you know the crazy problems we've had trying to get into this new building. Today we celebrate, last week I was crying, right? Today I can celebrate Big Bucket Sunday. Last week I was freaking out about Big Bucket Sunday. <laughs> this building we're currently in was also a miracle. It was answered on the very last hour. We were kicked out of the bar. I know that sounds weird, but our church used to be in a bar. We had nowhere to go. What happens? The Lord shows up. The building is made available, but we don't have enough money. Boom, a $50,000 gift by somebody who doesn't even come to our church was given to us so we could have church on Sunday. Amen. And then we fast forward. God keeps blessing us by bringing us more and more people like you to our church. Hallelujah. We moved to three services. The ceilings cave in. We moved to four services. The door falls off. <laughs> And now we need another new building <laughs> or we're going to run out of room real quick or the worship team is going to kill me. So eight months ago, we are wrestling with city codes. Nobody wants us here. We go through contractor after contractor. The cost of raising funds was way more than the faith that we had to support it. Now it's been two years and twice as long as we expected, but we went into the city with the plans and we're waiting for them to tell us there's another delayed waiting time because that's what the city does. We're worried that people think we're just making up this whole multiply thing. I'm just gonna sneak off to Miami. <laughs> and then we finally reach the top boss who has to approve these plans. We're waiting for the verdict. Turns out she went to high school with Pastor Byron. <laughs> Turns out she watches church online. Wow, thank you. you look great by the way, hello. We get approved by the city by the end of the week and construction is finally underway. Now we've got a big hole in our building. Come on. God is providing. I know things may seem hopeless at times, but when you keep the faith, you will see God's promise. When you keep the faith, you don't have to panic. When you keep the faith, you will remember that God is our great provider. When God is leading you, he will protect you. And when God is leading you, he will provide. Someone say hallelujah. Come on. Because if you're not dead, God's not done. That's right. That's right. Do not quit before the end of your trial. Watch what God does. Paul got a horse. <laughs> <laughs> now y'all like it. And an entire army. Paul was there for a reason. You are here for a reason. Some of you right now, you are way past the, the promise that was given. It's been so long before you, you remember the promise God gave you and you're starting to lose hope. There's been such a time in the gap. I'm telling you right now, stay patient. That's when God provides. Give God a shot. No matter how long it's been, remember his timing is always perfect. His timing is always right. 
do not quit. Take courage. Take courage. You are here for a reason. If you're not dead, he's not done. Don't stop praying. Don't stop now. Through your patience, God will provide. So as we close, I want you, I want you to pay attention to where the story ends because God will position you for something greater than you ever knew. We can trust God with our trials through his positioning. Paul was prepared for persecution. He has been providentially protected. So many Ps. God has provided him with safety and reassurance, and now God has positioned Paul exactly where he needs to be. Like I stated in the beginning, Paul's entire mission was what? To get the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. He could bring it to the epicenter of the world. So it, it could be spread across all the nations. Paul is now in the best possible position because he endured the trials. He endured the tribulations. And now God has put him on his greatest platform. He is finally in the best position to share the gospel. After the loss of friends, after all the oppression he's faced, after all the acts of violence towards him, Paul's pain will become his greatest platform. Because of Paul's preser preservation, God positions him so the gospel will spread to every nation. I know it doesn't always seem like there's a reason to keep going. But if you let your faith speak louder than your pain, then your pain will become your greatest platform. A few years ago, I met a lady at church. She said, uh, she told me a story about when she was 23 years old. Uh, she was living in sin. She was not a believer. And she had just moved in with her boyfriend. And her boyfriend and her were not doing well. It's always a great story when you move in with your boyfriend. Shouldn't do that. And then it doesn't go well and you have to move out. Right? Not a good situation to be in. This is where she put herself. And she finds out she's pregnant. At this time, she had zero aspirations to ever be a mother. She never wanted to be a mom. She had big dreams for her life. But this is not a part of the plan. She already didn't want to be with the father, so she decided she was going to have an abortion. She said, this is not the life for me. I'm just going to wash my hands of it and get a fresh start so I can get out of the situation. She talks to her friend at work, who's a believer, and she says, hey, why don't you, I know you're broke right now. Okay, I know you don't want to tell your mom. Why don't you go to the Hope Clinic, okay, and they'll provide resources. You can talk to them, and, and they'll walk you through your next steps, okay? With whatever you decide, they'll help you with that. So she did. She went. She went to the Hope Clinic, and by the end of one conversation, she decided, okay, I'm going to have the baby, actually. Even though I want to break up with this guy, even though this is going to ruin all the great dreams and plans I had for my life, I guess I'm going to have this baby. What she didn't realize was she was actually being ministered in at this time, okay? The Hope Clinic wasn't pushy about their beliefs, right? They're a gospel-centered um, organization, but they weren't pushy about it. She didn't know she was being ministered to, not just by them, but by the Holy Spirit. Because it was that conversation that led her to find faith in Christ. Her entire life changed. She had that baby. She had her daughter. And yesterday, she organized a team of 50 people from our church to go serve at the Hope Clinic because she is now passionate in outreach. She is passionate about what they're doing. And she's helping other mothers who are in a position similar to her with the situation they're in. She is now the outreach team lead here at Redemption. And my God, we love Vanessa. And we love Ella. Guys, redemption would be lost without Ella. If you, if you didn't know, now you know. But guess what? That's what God does. God will take your trials, your greatest test, and he'll turn it into a testimony. God will take your biggest mess and make it your greatest message. God will take your pain and turn it into your platform. Do not give up on your trials. Trust God to turn it around. So I would, I'd like to close today by reading this verse out of 1 Peter to remind all of us that our trials are a test. But in this test, we are not alone. Your trials are a test. They are shaping you. But, they are not, but you are not alone when you're facing these. Because God doesn't measure our success by our results, but by our faithfulness. 1 Peter says, Blessed be the God 
and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that it is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Redemption, you are not alone. I want to encourage you. At the end of every service, our prayer team is up here. Whatever trial you're walking through, I want to remind you, you're not alone. You will see breakthrough if you trust in his promise. Do not leave before receiving ministry from the Holy Spirit. You are not alone. God protects us. He provides for us and he positions us for greater purposes. You are not alone. He is with you. You are not alone. We are with you. We don't head into battle alone. Amen.